Okay, everyone, um, we're going to go ahead and start. Um, as I said, my name is Gregory Gale. I am the Director of Recruitment and Admissions, and I'm excited that you're here. Uh, we have a fantastic session planned for you. Uh, before we start, there are a few things I'd like you to be aware of. Uh, the session will be an hour long, um, and the session will be recorded uh, and will be uploaded to our website within the next two weeks. Um, concerning the format, um, we will be, I will be introducing our presenter shortly. Um, he will present, and at the end of his presentation, uh, he will be answering your questions. Afterwards, I will be giving a short presentation on the admissions process, as well as the financial aid process. The PowerPoints that we're using in today's session um, are located on your control panel uh, in the material section. So at any time during the presentation, please feel free to download it uh, and you can follow along. Additionally, um, please use the chat function option, which is also on your control panel, to submit your questions. Uh, and we welcome all of your questions. So uh, again, we're very excited that you're here. I'm also very excited to introduce to you our presenter. Uh, his name is Dr. Eric Mason. He is a professor at Nova Southeastern University. He works in the Department of Writing and Communication in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. At NSU, he teaches courses in writing, rhetoric, and digital media. His research looks at the intersection of technology and culture, focusing on multimodal textual genres not often studied in the college classroom. These include cookbooks, instruction manuals, and maps. He's also a lifetime gamer, which is appropriate for this presentation, a former carpenter, and considers himself part of the maker movement. So I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Eric Mason. Dr. Mason. All right, well, uh, hello everyone. All right, well, hello, everyone. Uh, you know, first, thank you for being here, and you know, thank you for the people uh, arranging this, uh, Greg and his staff. Um, my doctorate is in what's called rhetoric and composition, which is kind of just a fancy way of saying I study language and literacy and discourse, and also how to teach it. Um, but it is one of those few things that uh, you know, certainly qualify, qualifies me to teach college writing, uh, but also to study all sorts of media forms, including video games. Um, so I'm going to switch to the presentation. Uh, to make sure you can see it, or take me off for a second so you can focus on it. Um, so at this point, I've introduced myself as both a gamer and a rhetorician, uh, two groups that don't always get positive press in the public sphere. And gamers are sometimes assumed to be you know, lazy loners, you know, prone to aggression and obesity, and rhetoric is considered to be the tool of liars and manipulators, a uh, substitute for action and honesty. So uh, phrases, we have phrases like empty rhetoric, and that's just rhetoric. And these things shape people's perception of my professional identity. So gamers, I, uh, I feel your pain, right, for all you mature and uh, sort of responsible gamers out there. Uh, now I'm here to talk a little bit today about why video games matter, uh, really to everyone, but especially to educators, uh, to students, to legislators, to artists, to activists, and business owners. Um, and to be uh, honest, um, many of these groups don't really need convincing. Um, you know, they've already sort of agreed, um, you know, that this is something that they want to do. They've already put this into practice. Uh, you see here some screenshots uh, from games like Second Life, right, where activists use this 3D virtual world as a digital form for political action and community organizing. Uh, the middle picture shows the what's called the Simulation Technology Applied to Trauma Care program uh, used by medical schools to help uh, uh, student doctors learn how to practice surgical procedures. 
Uh, and commercial games like Portal on the right there have been used in schools to teach physics. Uh, and of course, businesses have really been at the vanguard as well. Uh, over 70% of major employers use, use video games to train employees. Uh, so if you work for Cold Stone Creamery, for instance, uh, you could be asked to play a game that helps you perfect and standardize the size of the ice cream scoop you deliver to customers. And of course, you know, recreational video game play is at an all-time high. Uh, the Entertainment Software Association reports that the U.S. market for video games was over $30 billion in 2016, and worldwide revenues are at over $90 billion. Uh, so in answer to the kind of almost fake question of whether games can be used to forward political and artistic, professional, and educational projects, I think the obvious answer is yes. But I'm really also here to talk about why this is so. Uh, what makes video games such ideal environments for this kind of learning? And perhaps a long way to explode a few myths about gamers and gaming. So um, the three claims here, right, um, which of course are a little bit academic-y, but just, just here to kind of give you a preview of the kind of examples I'm going to show you. Um, you know, present a kind of pushback against some of the assumptions often made about video games and gamers. Uh, video gamers are not only solitary ventures where games perform rote actions, but they're really intense sites of collaboration and problem solving. Uh, communication scholars like James Paul G prefer to call gamers learners embedded in a material and social world, not just a virtual or digital world. Uh, gamers themselves are often embedded in sophisticated ecologies of learning where players are required to collect, analyze, and utilize in-game information to understand the rules and limitations of the game world. Um, and finally, uh, on the bottom one, it says video games are engaging meta experiences. Which it's kind of an odd phrase, but basically it means that often you must go outside the game as a gamer. You have to practice and develop literacies beyond the screen in order to be successful within the game environment. Um, so if any of you know Marshall McLuhan, a uh, communications theorist, he would often say, you know, the medium is the message. Right? And he often ignored almost the content of the medium. So the medium itself kind of changes how we experience the world, you know, uh, develop identities, things like that. Um, so that really, I'm not so much here to talk about the content of individual video games, but the kind of world in which video games exist and how it kind of allows us to develop. Um, so uh, Foldit, for example, is a great example of a, uh, a kind of game that supports these three theses. Uh, developed by the University of Washington's Center for Game Science and Department of Biochemistry, uh, Foldit invites players to you know, fold the structures of selected proteins in a kind of puzzle um, to create you know, a certain kind of structure. And researchers tested the high scoring folds in this game to see if they can be then applied to relevant proteins in the real world, helping to target and eradicate diseases, create biological innovations. Uh, and researchers have reported that you know, the human players, which is over you know, something like I think 60 or 70,000 at this point, uh, they often mashed or outperformed algorithmically computed solutions. So there's things that, you know, gamers, you know, individuals, human beings can do that, you know, w isn't necessarily better uh, or, say, isn't necessarily worse than what the computer can do by itself. Uh, so this becomes a social endeavor that's engaging uh, for the players, um, you know, but it's also, uh, you know, a way to practice things like pattern recognition skills, and these this digital play can have positive effects in the material world. Now, what you're seeing right now is kind of, in a sense, why video games really matter to me, right? Um, this is my son, Noah. And as you can see, like, he loves video games, right? He's often dressed up for Halloween uh, as video game characters. So as a parent, I'm, of course, concerned about how much and what kinds of media he consumes. Uh, but as a rhetorician who studies literacy and learning, I think I've been able to find value in things that others might, uh, you know, become anxious because of. So the, uh, you know, so... What this really, uh, and to talk about his, like, he's, you know, growing up, he's, he's nine years old now, it's really been a kind of, you know, long experiment in literacy for me, uh, both video games and through other media. Um, so, for instance, here's kind of a mock-up of a page in a book that uh, we read together when he was first learning how to read. Because uh, language itself is a kind of a shared resource. It's a social endeavor. Uh, we learn through modeling, repetition. And this book, like many other books for early readers, you know, showed an image at the top and one word at the bottom to help children you know, figure out the, the naming function of language and the association between letters and sounds. And my son looked at this image and the word at the bottom of the page, and after a brief pause, he sat there and he, he said, mm ows, right? Um, and of course, a parent should be happy when their child is learning to read and when they sort of look and, and, and they get it. Um, what this event really convinced me of is that my son was a liar. Um, because at the bottom of the page, it didn't say M-O-U-S-E, it said R-A-T, rat. Um, and so, was my son learning to read at that point? Like, was he 
sort of engaging in this sort of back and forth, this kind of game that, that we were playing? And, you know, was he kind of doing what he was supposed to be doing? I think some parents might look at it and say, wow, you know, he's sort of doing something unethical. Um, he's sort of lying. He's manipulating me thinking, you know, making me think that he can read. Uh, but in another sense, uh, he was actually performing the act of reading, the kind of social act of reading, picking up on all the social cues that regulate this activity. Uh, he knew, for instance, that he should pronounce the word slowly, uh, sounding out each letter that, in this case, wasn't actually there. Um, but he was performing learning, entering into the discourse community of readers by adopting the way of speaking associated with being a member of this group, uh, just as college students who I teach do when they perform the ways of researching that scientists do, the ways of arguing that literary critics perform, or the language of psychologists. Uh, so learning is really kind of a, a, a performance. It's really it really is kind of that fake it before you make it kind of thing. So looking at this, I could look at my son's, you know, literacy, his you know, faking reading, and see that it was actually a step in his development. And so video games, I think, sort of have a lot to do with our identity development as well, and are actually ideal kind of situations for this identity development. Um, and this idea of identity development has kind of a long history in my field, at least. Um, and it really is, uh, you know, or it can be tied back to uh, this guy Richard Lanham, right? who came up with these two ways of thinking about um, ourselves uh, as either, you know, the species homo seriosus, a serious man, or homo rhetoricus, rhetorical man. Uh, and the difference basically is that, you know, homo seriosus sees themselves as sort of static, sort of not moving. Uh, they have this kind of central, essentialized self uh, that doesn't really change very much. And to kind of perform anything else would be dishonest, right? But homo rhetoricus, as he said, is an actor. Uh, he's dramatic. Um, he sees himself in a social situation and not committed to any single construction of the world. And instead, he says, to prevailing in the game at hand. Uh, so I think literacy is itself a form of game. Uh, learning is itself a kind of game. And the fact that video games, you know, turn these you know, kind of discourse games into actual games, into, or, you know, visual games, into haptic games, things that we can touch and feel and see, um, you know, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, and our communities, our sort of online communities based around things like social media and, uh, you know, and, and video games kind of adopt these two ways of thinking about people. You know, Facebook, for instance, at one point said that, you know, that they're a community where people you know, use their authentic identities, right, you know, to keep us safe. You know, they use the name they use in real life. Uh, you know who you're connecting with. And this is that homo seriosis, that thinking of your identity as being sort of, you know, stable. Now, of course, if you use Facebook, you know that there's nothing, in a sense, uh, you know, automatically authentic about the identities that we put up there. Uh, that it is something that we perform constantly by taking certain kinds of pictures, sharing certain kinds of information. Um, that it is in itself, even if Facebook sort of claims here that it's about your authentic identity, it's really about, you know, a developing identity. But this becomes very obvious, very material, very sort of, um, sort of engaging in something like Second Life, you know, a 3D virtual world where you have an avatar, this digital persona you create and customize. Uh, and they promise that the only limit is your imagination, you know, who do you want to be? Uh, so I think this is a more productive and fruitful way to think about identity is actually embedded in things like um, like video games as compared to things like social media where we sort of, you know, want to pretend like what we're presenting is real. So, um, and there are other sort of combinations or uh, connections between identity and the virtual worlds that we play in. Uh, a very sort of interesting one, I think, is what's called the Proteus effect. Uh, it's this phenomenon in which basically uh, human behavior can be changed by the expectations set by a digital avatar. Um, and this, you can sort of imagine this happening within a digital environment where you might be playing a game, you might be sort of acting out that character, not focusing on your identity so much as the identity of the person that you are uh, pretending to be or sort of adopting the persona of. Uh, and that certainly makes you know, some sense that you would kind of act uh, but these actions, you know, also sort of carry over to human behavior, how you act both within the game, even when you're not playing the character, but also outside the game. Uh, the researchers have noted that people who sort of adopt certain kinds of personas, you know, tend to uh, adopt those characteristics outside the game. Um, and part of the way they do this is actually through language, to look at, you know, how, uh, how individuals sort of complete words, you know, what sort of sentences they construct, you know, after having played certain kinds of games, certain kinds of characters. Uh, and I think there's a sense in which we do need to be concerned about the kinds of characters and situations, uh, you know, apparent or available in games, uh, because they do carry over into real life. They are, in a sense, they are already real life. Um, and the, uh, 
you know, the, the comic on the right there is a pretty famous one uh, from New York Times. It's actually uh, the most downloaded comic ever, supposedly. Uh, on the internet, you know, nobody knows you're a dog, right? Um, and if you think about this comic, it's coming from a time when, you know, identity was considered to be sort of, you know, in a sense, secret from, you know, like in the online world. That being online meant you could hide who you were. Um, you know, that your identity was sort of in the real world. And when you went online, you, know, you could be whatever you want, but people couldn't know. But nowadays, um, you know, people can look you up, you know, with all, the, with all the data gathering, with all the doxing, where people find out your personal information and post it and connect it to your online persona. You know, you know the situation, I think, is kind of reversed. Uh, but on the Internet, you know, everyone can sort of figure out who you are or, you know, at least certain companies, you know, hackers. And so, you know, identity, online identity is not so separate and um, sort of hidden or sort of protected, um, you know, from our real world lives. Um, so I don't think that, um, you know, comic could really be put out today and really make as much sense. Now, Let's talk a little bit about literacy and about documents and sort of my sort of, uh, you know, a lot of research deals with kind of textual genres that people produce through games, but really outside of games, right? Um, and so what you're seeing in front of you is a, uh, a page from the manual to an instruction manual to, to an old game, you know, from the 80s called King's Quest II, put out by the Sierra Company. Um, and so that's a page, you know, from the actual instruction manual, which actually, you know, all of it, basically, except this uh, one page, was really kind of story. It was really narrative, sort of background story. But they created this one page to telling you kind of how to be a gamer, you know, how to play the game. Um, not just who you were or who your character was, but what it really meant to, to play. Um, and as you see that, you know, it says you, you, you and Ken Graham will not be able to fulfill the prophecy without mapping your progress. You know, draw a map. Um, and so these these genres that we often don't teach, we often don't study in the academy, have always sort of fascinated me. Um, and on the right, you have the actual map that I drew, I think, as a, uh, I believe, a 10-year-old. Um, and looking at it, you can see, I think, a lot of interesting things about literacy, about textuality. Um, and part of it, you know, is, of course, that I didn't know how to spell poison, if you look at the top. Uh, but beyond that, you know, there's really different communities here. There's different communities of practice. There's different forms of literacy being practiced here. So on the left, you have the developer's map. Right? which really, to me, you know, they say here's a typical map, but to me it's not a typical map at all. It doesn't really look like what a map looks like. Uh, it looks like a spreadsheet. It looks like a corporate document. It looks like something an architect might draw. Uh, and that really is the function of a map for that group. You know, they're not maybe concerned with what it's going to look like. The artists haven't come in and actually defined the visual aspect of that world. Uh, they're interested in, in the connections um, and the kind of staging in the areas that have to be created and then sort of filled with content later. Um, and this is part of what we usually call like the game bibles, right? Um, you know, most uh, game developers have these sort of doc have these documents that sort of contain all this planning, all these ideas, all these diagrams, all this information that kind of is often not really visible uh, directly in the actual game world. So that's the map that they gave us. Uh, but the one that I created, um, you know, tries to sort of, you know, uh, get to the user's ex experience of the game, to think about what it means for me to play the game. You know, I experience the game screen by screen. So instead of, you know, ovals or circles, I have, you know, squares or rectangles. Um, and oddly enough, like, you know, you might say that your screen right now is probably like 16 by 9, you know, sort of wider than it is tall. But at the time, you know, the screens were typically square um, that I was playing on. So, um, you know, the old sort of CRT monitors. So, you know, I think that just, you know, putting it in a square, Making it very visual uh, certainly was part of, uh, you know, my experience as a user of the game that I was seeing. Uh, a few other sort of, I think, interesting things about the literacies I was learning, you know, as I played the game here, um, is that I did pick up on the, where it says in Map Your Progress, it says, um, it says, draw a map showing what different directions lead where, objects found, dangerous areas. So all the objects found are sort of within a little sort of rectangle. So down at the bottom, there's a brooch, uh, there's earrings and soup and a basket. Um, yeah, so there's, I've actually done what it's told me though. I actually took some direction from them, but then I made decisions that really didn't fall along with what I said and also didn't actually fall along with what I saw on the screen. Uh, so let me show you the actual screen, you know, one of the actual screens from this uh, VGA Wonder. Um, so on the top left, you've got an actual close-up of one of the uh, squares from the map that I drew. And then on the right, you have the actual screen. 
And so you can see that certainly I captured critical elements, I think, of the screen. You know, the bridge, the rock, the tree. Uh, I didn't put myself, the user, like King Graham, actually in the image, because I guess it wouldn't make sense to have a map that showed you on it everywhere, uh, since I was always on the screen somewhere. Uh, and certainly my position was not static, so I couldn't really represent it, I think, carefully. Uh, but there's other things on here, like the horizon, that I chose not to represent. Because to me, a map was, you know, a kind of top-down visual, right? To have a kind of horizon on every screen, you know, wouldn't have made sense to me as a map. So I'm here, like, translating, right? I'm sort of translating, um, you know, what I'm seeing into a different kind of text. Um, so it's not rote, right? I'm sort of solving problems of representation, like how do I represent what I'm seeing on the screen? How do I pick and choose details that are important? Uh, like this is a you know sophisticated learning environment, you know, for you know for a child at least to kind of figure out what it means to sort of create documents like this. Uh, and what you're seeing at the bottom of the screen on the left, uh, this map was actually part of what's called uh, Plagmata, uh, the Player Generated Map and Document Archive. Um, and the archivist is it's a digital archive, you know, um, that you can go look at, you know, Plagmata.org. Uh, but one of the archivists had a uh, had a showing, had a gallery showing as part of a uh, as part of a art event uh, called space, actually called Space Invaders, kind of you know games invading this you know gallery space, uh, and he collected actual print versions of you know various documents that were in the archive, and this map was one that's on the end there on the right. Uh, this was in Liverpool, England. So this map that I drew, you know, when I was 10 years old, has sort of made the rounds in a sense, and has you know sort of been archived. It's you know part of the history in a sense of gaming and sort of how gamers have interacted, you know, with these systems. Um, so, you know, maybe I can't put it on my CV exactly, but, you know, I thought it was kind of cool, you know, that, A, that I found it, you know, many years after that I was able to use it. Uh, one thing about the screen that you're looking at, um, at the very bottom, you know, it has a place to type, and this was actually on the game stream. This is, you know, before sort of click, you know, clicking to do things. Uh, you actually had to type instructions. So not only was I learning what are called procedural rhetorics, sort of how to do things like figuring out the rules, figuring out what to do, um, you know, learning it sort of as I went, you know, figuring things out, um, because there were very few tutorials at this time in these kinds of games. Uh, but to actually interact with it, I actually had to write. I had to become a writer, and I had to write clear instructions, the kind of imperative sentences that, you know, I teach my technical writing students to do. Um, and every time I hit enter, basically a usability test of my instruction was played out on the screen. Uh, so I think there was a lot of learning going on here uh, that I was, you know, now I, I look back and I'm both sort of thankful for, and I find very interesting in terms of if this is what was going on in, you know, in the 80s, you know, how much sort of better, you know, could we be sort of taking advantage of this, uh, of this environment today? Um, so to think sort of more broadly about what's going on today, um, you know, we are getting away from the map as the kind of space of the game and thinking about the game within the space of the world, right? So augmented reality gaming, virtual reality gaming, uh, these are ways to sort of think about expanding, um, you know, how we game and where we game. And I think this is actually, you know, both really interesting, but also sort of uh, you know, allows us to see many more practical applications, uh, especially augmented reality. There's, you know, been a lot of interest in the industry uh, certainly the, the military and such, about sort of how to overlay information into the world and you know, how to make, you know, things accessible, uh, things like Google Glass and such, you know, ways that sort of, um, you know, make the uh, interface between the digital and the virtual, you know, you know, existent within the material world. Um, and Marshall McLuhan actually said, uh, you know, that the new media are not bridges between man and nature, they are nature. And so I think we're getting to the point where we're going to see less uh, division, you know, less separation uh, between these two worlds, and that games, in a sense, will become, uh, you know, just a sort of routine part of life, a routine part of learning, that it won't seem odd, you know, to go and play a game to learn something. Um, and there are other examples of this that kind of make use of various kinds of technologies. One is something like geocaching, um, which I also enjoy, where, you know, people hide you know, objects, uh, caches in the material world, and then sort of leave information so people can bring, you know, use digital tools, uh, things like GPS, you know, satellites and such, you know, to find these objects and record that they've been there and, and to trade items and such. So, um, you know, geocaching is another one of these sports or activities that really sort of show the, uh, you know, the interest in sort of bringing games, you know, into the material world. Um, so, so sort of think in terms of Marshall McLuhan, right? Uh, many of you may be familiar with this idea of sort of hot and cool media. Um, and the basic distinction is that hot media, like film, um, 
don't really ask you to sort of do much. They sort of, uh, you know, give you sort of intense uh, experiences. They sort of send a lot of you know, information at you, but they don't really require much in the way of a response. Where cool media require participation. They require attention. Um, they require you to sort of, you know, craft in some way your response. And I think whereas at one point we may have seen, um, you know, video games or certain kinds of video games as, you know, sort of hot media. You sort of play and it's kind of rote and it's, you know, it's maybe the same thing over and over. I think nowadays we recognize them more and more as cool media, as kind of participatory, as things that uh, really require thought and consideration. Um, at, at one point, uh, you know, Wired Magazine ran an article called, uh, what was it? You know, it was called, You Play World of Warcraft, You Are Hired. Um, that people recognized that, um, you know, playing games like this that were very social, that were very interactive, that were very much about planning and organizing, you know, was really a form of, you know, management of, you know, of human resources management. Uh, so they were interested, you know, certain companies in sort of finding people that already had these experiences within the gaming world and could use that as proof of their ability to do it, you know, in, you know, in a sense, quote, unquote, the, the uh, real world. Um, so, uh, and it also sort of reminds me of, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, attempt to sort of, you know, make these media, video games more participatory, um, you know, in initiatives like Scratch uh, for MIT, which is a, a visual coding system that allows, uh, you know, mostly kids, but many adults too, to learn more about coding to produce video games. Uh, and this idea of sort of getting people to think about games and think of themselves as producers, not just consumers, you see it in things like... Uh, Nintendo's Mario Maker, where uh, it allows you to sort of build levels, to become level designers. Um, things like Scratch don't like, you know, make, make sure you can't just play the game, but actually see under the hood. Down on the left there, you actually see the screen, like any game that you see there, or any piece of art that you see there that, that's been coded by someone, you can actually look at how it was coded. You can actually remix it, right? So, um, you know, making games, you know, part of the kind of Web 2.0 system where you can not only sort of view and, you know, look, but also contribute and add and remix, uh, I think is an important step in sort of making coding, um, you know, and, and the, the play videos into actually producing video games. Um, so these producer-like ways in which, you know, children are sort of now approaching games, I think is really significant, uh, that they'll see these genres as, you know, forms of expression, as uh, things that they can, uh, as sort of Ian Bogost uh, calls them, um, become sort of persuasive games, things where they want to change the world, you know, through the games that they create. Um, so, um, Nancy Kaplan has also said in a uh, essay called Knowing Practice that our technologies, you know, limit what we can learn. And so, for instance, uh, if any of you drive like a manual transmission, like there's certain things you learn, I think, you know, driving a manual transmission using transmission that just, if you drive an automatic, you just don't have to learn. Um, and so I think, um, the differences in sort of game system, for instance, like console gaming is great. My you know, son and I, you know, have a you know a Wii and a Switch, um, but you know I also think that there's some limitations to those technologies as to what you can learn about games and how they work and how they're created. Uh, you know, PC gaming and things like Scratch that really sort of encourage you to sort of change the game system, to change the game world, to make it your own to create the sprites, you know, to record the audio. Uh, these are different, you know, ways of playing video games. These are different ways of sort of existing in the, uh, in the video game world. Um, and if we don't sort of see, uh, you know, if we don't have these spaces, these environments, you know, video games are incredible learning environments, but, you know, they can't, and they're sort of restricted if it's just, you know, sort of consuming what we see, as, no matter how sophisticated. Uh, but at the same time, even games that we think are mainly sort of consumption, you know, where you just sort of play it, you don't really change it. Uh, even then, I think just like the map that I drew as a child, I think gamers are producing things around that. They're having discussions. They're getting on discussion boards and having arguments, you know, about the design of the world, about the usability, about changes in the rules. And all this, you know, really leads to what we call procedural rhetorics. Uh, this idea of, um, you know, figuring out the rules by which uh, organizations work, by which computer programs work, uh, all these ways in which, you know, institutions work, you know, really run by procedures, by policies, by rules, by algorithms, you know, for instance. And so I think, you know, video games are certainly procedural documents themselves, you know, follow code, you know, as random as they might be, um, 
you know, but it's also getting students to think in ways that I think are valuable in today's world, to think about you know, how technology shapes us and how we shape technology uh, through these procedures. Um, my dad actually um, you know, worked for a company called uh, Gould and, and Encore, um, and actually uh, worked in Harris, uh, you know, growing up, and actually part of those companies you know, built simulators uh, you know, for, the, for the military. And really, the idea of simulation really has a lot of, in common with uh, you know, the games that, that's, that people are creating nowadays. Um, the ways of putting people into situations where they can learn, where you know, there's a correspondence often to the real world, that something is learned about the real world through the game. Um, so I think the best video games for many purposes are actually simulations, especially for those corporate purposes, um, you know, for those business purposes where you want to train people, where you're really focusing on education. Uh, but at the same time, even in Scratch, there's a lot of artistic options. There's a lot of things that people do um, to sort of create, you know, sort of new and sort of interesting and, you know, maybe just fun, uh, you know, text as well. And so I think, you know, inviting sort of uh, students, inviting, uh, you know, educators, legislators, all these people to come in and sort of perform in these spaces, to think about identity and community as something that is dynamic in these spaces is really a great thing. Um, even some uh, municipalities have found ways where they can sort of turn the care of their community into a game. Uh, in, uh, in Hawaii, for instance, they have these, uh, these emergency sort of air horns, and they often fall into disrepair, but they found a way to create an app where people adopted them, um, where people took care of them. And if people didn't take care of them, people could sort of swoop in and kind of, you know, take it away from them and sort of, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, steal, you know, uh, steal your base away from you. Uh, but it was all in the purpose of actually, you know, supporting the community. So, um, you know, I, I certainly want to make sure I leave, you know, time for questions and, and sort of anything people want to know more about. And just as a reminder, like, these are, you know, these three sort of important, I think, uh, trends, I think, in video games. And sort of, as I said, kind of theses that counter a lot of the, you know, I think assumptions or stereotypes out there about video games and gamers themselves. Um, you know, the video games are sort of complex, you know, social ecologies that people are doing things together, that it's not so much solitary and it's not... Um, often about uh, you know, just treating someone on, a, on an individual basis. And unfortunately, sometimes I think you know, what we see on the screen is something an individual is doing, but we don't see what's going on behind them socially or with someone else. Um, I think it's interesting, for instance, especially in regards to literacy, these complex social oncologies involves other forms of uh, you know, digital media, such as blogs and wikis. Uh, at one point, I'm not sure if it's still true, but the uh, you know, Wikipedia is certainly, you know, often considered the, the largest English language wiki. Um, but for a long time, the World of Warcraft wiki, you know, centered around this one uh, digital game, uh, was the second largest English language wiki, right? And part of this is actually uh, promoted by kind of how publishers have dealt with the text that they produce, like instruction manuals, uh, that it became both sort of difficult to actually uh, to pay to, to kind of produce these, these manuals for these games that were huge, these kind of open world games where you really couldn't um, you know, sort of uh, summarize everything. You couldn't put the images of everything and the description of everything into a booklet, you know, that, that you could sell to people. It would, it would be too huge. Uh, so these things had to go digital, but instead of creating them, uh, a lot of companies basically uh, invited users, players, to produce these things themselves. And some of these get sold, um, you know, as well as sort of given out free, but now they're, they're video, their websites, are different forms. Uh, but things like the World of Warcraft wiki, where people participate and collaborate, is exactly the kind of you know, sort of meta experience I think gamers have in regards to literacy. Uh, producing things that they care about, things that they're proud of, things that are often ignored by their teachers as maybe not really sort of real writing. Uh, but I think we should look at these as, you know, really great opportunities to sort of involve, you know, students, if, if you're an educator, um, you know, to make connections between their video game lives and their, you know, sort of school lives. Um, and these are, as I said, sophisticated learning ecologies. Like there's a lot of learning that goes into them. Uh, and this idea of procedural literacy, I think, really makes it applicable to a lot of different fields, a lot of different processes. Um, and just lastly, that kind of meta experience, this, you know, really, I think, paying attention to what goes on outside the screen is, is very important. Uh, that the relationships that form or fail to form in our material worlds, you know, due to video games is, you know, much more important sometimes than, let's say, like, the, uh, than the content of the game itself. Uh, that you could be playing many different, you know, genres, but that social aspect may still be there that production aspect, that coding aspect can, can still be there. Um, so um, I guess I want to, you know, end with uh, just a call for questions and sort of things you might want to know more about. Uh, there's certainly a lot of 
initiatives out there. A lot of games I haven't played, of course, um, you know, but uh, you know, I'm happy to sort of uh, to talk about whatever I can. Uh, wonderful, Dr. Mason. Um, I do have a few questions actually to ask you. Um, one of the questions is just a general question. What attracted you to this topic? So uh, I would certainly say being a gamer myself, I think that's certainly part of it. Um, you know, that's knowing that people kind of look down upon it. Uh, I sort of mentioned that rhetoric and video gaming are both things that are kind of often portrayed negatively in some way in, in the public sphere. Uh, if you don't know Milton, for instance, uh, compared rhetoricians, or he compared the devil to rhetoricians, let's say, like he described the devil as basically a great rhetorician. Uh, so I feel like that's always hanging over me. And so I sometimes look at people like my son, for instance, who you know, does a lot of video games. I want to make sure that you know, he recognizes and others recognize that what he does is not you know, invaluable, you know, that, that it's not something that's hurting him or keeping him from learning how to speak or to argue or any of these things we expect literate people to do. And for my knowledge, define the term gamer. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I said that James Walji, like, prefers to use the term learner. Um, that gamer, you know, video gamer, you know, I guess could be applied to anyone who sort of plays games. But, um, you know, other people will say, like, some gamers are consumers, right, who sort of focus on, you know, playing the game, having fun, maybe not really engaging much with the community. Uh, but that uh, there's another group that we call sometimes prosumers, who are kind of half producer, half consumer. Uh, and so I guess you can sort of start to classify gamers a little bit. Uh, and I think, you know, and I would agree that, you know, there are ways to play games and gamers that do it in a way that is less educational, less interesting, you know, to me as a researcher, less um, sort of productive, less positive. So I want to ignore the fact that people can get, you know, addicted to games or they can play games in a way that sort of detracts from their development in other ways. Um, so when I think of gamers, I think of, you know, a range of different types of activities, a range of different types of involvement. Um, and, I, you know, I'm sort of focused on recognizing those gamers who are really, you know, developing literacies. Um, and that, uh, you know, in my classes, I guess, in the, uh, um, oh, I should have said, let me, uh, I don't know if you can still see my, uh, presentation, but uh, that Space Invaders game, I, I don't think I actually mentioned it when, when the scratch screen was up. Um, like that was actually a game produced by my master's students in the, uh, you know, in our master's program uh, here in Composition Rhetoric in Digital Media. And so I was trying to get them to imagine to explore the kind of scratch space and produce a game. It took us, you know, just a week uh, to put up a kind of fun game for students to kind of take a break for midterms but to really, you know, get them to think about themselves as gamers, even though very few of them actually identified as gamers. Uh -huh. uh, so I wanted them to think of themselves about what does it mean to be a gamer, to be a learner who sort of uses games as a kind of way towards learning, um, you know, procedurally about the world. About, about the world. Um, so Chris Netterville has a question, and I'm going to read it. So it sounds like you believe puzzle-based video games are more useful in terms of education could, however, other genres of video games be used for other forms of education other than composition and rhetoric, such as morally complicated games like Heavy Rain in a series uh, on ethics? Uh, so, yeah, I think that is, you know, I certainly believe puzzle-based games, but I also just believe they're, they're an easy sell to people. You know, things that are math games, things that are puzzle-based, I think it's, it's easy to see the kind of critical thinking involved. Uh, but there's so many different forms of critical thinking that are valuable, you know, things based on ethical situations, things based on social education, um, you know, things that are sort of medically useful, not in terms of, you know, discovering diseases, but actually just sort of uh, in terms of like self-therapy and such. Um, you know, so I think uh, all the interest in sort of artificial intelligence, you know, for instance, is a way to think procedurally about identity development you know, you might not think about it in the form of a game, but in the form of an interaction with a series of procedures. Um, so, yes, I, I guess my question, or my answer, uh, that other genre of video games I think could be very useful, but I think, you know, yes, Portal lends itself to learning physics in many ways, but you could also use it as a platform for understanding ethics. Um, you know, and think about, you know, the relationships between institutions, you know, between robots and humans, you know, between um, designers of experiences and the people who 
have those experiences. Um, and I will admit I have not played Heavy Rain, um, so I, I, I can't speak directly to that. Um, you know, I, I think all gamers have their sort of, uh, you know, sort of blind spots, um, so I will admit to that. But I certainly think uh, the kinds of narratives, it's like asking if film could address these issues, right? And I think people would say, of course, you know, films bring up ethical issues and bring up social issues. And, you know, for video games to not be regarded as being equally versatile and sort of addressing all these kinds of social issues, I think is would be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but I also don't think you have to specifically design games to teach these things to teach these things, right? King's Quest II is not designed to teach me how to draw a map. Uh, it was not designed to teach me how to think about the screen versus the page and teach me to think about representation, but it did so anyway, right? Uh, so I think it's really about, uh, um, what's his name, Kyle Stedman talks about games as designed experiences, but like I said, those experiences go, I think, far beyond the video game, that you can't limit what you, what you know the game is teaching to just what you think you're teaching. Okay. Um, um, we have another question from Juliana. Recently, I read in the New York Times that Mark Zuckerberg is looking to invest in a math video game program. How do parents and educators understand when learning is taking place and when diffuse relaxation mode is taking place? Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting question in terms of, you know, um, again, a lot of people want to create games that you know, are very targeted toward these specific skills. And I don't think it's a bad, you know, idea and attempt, and certainly math and, and STEM in general you know, has a very uh, high profile right now. Um, and I think it is important. I think it has to do with, as what I call procedural rhetorics, you know, the importance of them, that we really do need to understand the kind of processes and procedures in place that, you know, guide our actions and constrict, you know, what we're able to do uh, and allow what we're able to do and enable what we do as well. Um, but yeah, to kind of understand when learning is taking place and when it's not, when they're sort of turned off, you know, it's almost like the difference between hot and cool media. Like, when are you really doing something participatory and interesting? Uh, and I think as a parent, I struggle with this too, that I sort of wonder, you know, if I let him play this, if I let my son play this, like, is he really, you know, doing something useful? Um, and so I think it's hard to have a, a general statement about when to know this is happening. Uh, I think it'll be you know, depending on the, on, on the player, on the learner. Uh, you can have 20 students in a class and you know, not all of them will be learning at the same way at the same time, sort of on the ball, kind of, you know, every example, some examples might hit some of the students, but not others. Uh, so I think as a teacher, I'm constantly trying to assess that, right? Trying to figure out, you know, am I sort of getting through to my students? Uh, are they kind of engaged at the moment? Uh, and I think, I'm trying to think of a uh, example for some, from a video game that really sort of, uh, you know, was like might be a teachable moment, for instance. And so I think maybe it's up to us as gamers to kind of say, well, when I, when I played this game, you know, this really happened at this stage, at this point. And you know, I think for me with King's Quest 2, it was sort of creating something to map. Um, but for others, it may be sort of realizing, you know, something about history, about the connection, you know, playing civilization and sort of realizing something about sort of how history sort of transforms the world, the relationship between technology and uh, sort of innovation and politics or something. So um, I'm also, you know, uh, you know, grew up, you know, loving to play board games, you know, Avalon Hill games and such. And I think the very same things can happen in those if they are in some way, you know, basically a simulation, uh, you know, of the way the kind of procedures through which the world works. Um, but yeah, my, my son, like sometimes I know he's just wasting time to some degree and that's also okay. I think we don't have to look to video games as the savior of education and okay. imagine every video game as being, you know, all, 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 all the time learning. So in that um, uh, same format, how can you, could you please touch on gaming being a valuable form of literacy um, for activist purposes? Sure. Um, so I think there's a, you know, there's what we call the serious gaming movement. Uh, you know, like I said, Ian Bogus has a book called Persuasive Games, and so if you search for, you know, serious gaming, you'll find a number of games have been created, you know, with specific purposes to sort of draw attention to um, issues of kind of uh, water shortages in certain countries, things like landmines, about the difficulty of sort of finding and removing them, that people have sort of found ways to create games that 
you know, get people to pay attention, to get them to sort of give a little bit of their time to thinking about what it's like to not be themselves. Okay. And I think a lot of activism is sort of based around that idea. Um, and a lot of activism uh, is, I think, uh, what a rhetorician would call sort of enthemomatic, sort of based on enthememes, based on kind of the user supplying part of the argument, sort of it not being told to them, but, you know, sort of figuring out as you experience it. Um, and so I think games are are good at that kind of activist work and not just sort of um, preaching to people, not just sort of telling them, hey, this is what it is and you got to change your mind, but getting them to sort of come to the realization on their own. Uh, but there were, you know, there was a game, you know, created, you know, specifically around Obama's election uh, in 2008 that you could go and play and it sort of allowed you to kind of, you know, show your support. But there's a lot of games out there like that, if you search for the serious game, that kind of do, you know, try to address specific issues. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the site, but there's like the rice game where you can sort of engage in a form of, you know, uh, you can sort of you know, gather donations. You sort of learn, you know, words at the same time that rice gets donated, you know, to people who need it. So, you know, there's all these kind of combinations out there, I think, where, you know, learning is going on, but there's also some sort of activism happening as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where else it could take place? Uh, you know, I think a lot of, inside of a lot of games, there are, you know, uh, points where people design their own uh, avatars, where people design their own uh, sprays and they put images up. And a lot of times these sprays in certain games are very activist oriented, you know, drawing attention to political issues. Uh, you know, people's names even that they give themselves are often sort of forms of activism. Um, but uh, in Second Life, for instance, when you can design your own avatar, people, you know, will sort of choose things uh, right after a U.S. senator sort of described the Internet as a series of tubes <laughs> as a way, and people thought he kind of like, it showed that he really didn't understand the Internet and thought of it as more of a, uh, like one of those air mail systems, you know, from the use at the bank or something. Um, like, you know, people created avatars, you know, within Second Life that were a series of tubes, you know. So they were kind of touching base you know, with the, you know, with the real world, you know, showing their political, um, you know, sort of, uh, positions, you know, through how they represent themselves. And it may be very sort of, uh, you might say that's kind of low-key activism, that it's not sort of, you know, marching in the streets or something. But I think if these are the spaces where people are congregating, if these are the digital forums for communities, then it has to exist there as well in whatever, you know, native format makes sense. Yeah, I believe that was Senator Ted Stevens. Um, so, uh, Juliana has another question. The program they were hoping to use is code.org. Um, how is this similar or different than what you know or what you own in on? So, to remember, I've looked at, you know, a series of different sites. And, you know, with my son, we've actually, you know, gone into different sites and played with them. Like, uh, code.org, like things like Kodu, I mean, all these different systems that allow you to build games. Um, you know, the, I'll say the main thing I focus on in my classes is Scratch, and I guess I'll tell you, you know, sort of emphasize why, and you can see if those things are available in code.org. Um, you know, Scratch does not teach a specific computer language. Uh, it teaches um, computing processes, computing concepts, right, programming concepts. So things like loops, uh, things like all sorts of different triggers and variables and such, things that you would need to understand in any programming language. And so I like that because, I mean, I don't know if, I think code.org allows you to choose a, a range of different programming languages. Uh, but I think for certain age groups, you know, having it be visual, having it be sort of tactile, you sort of drag things together and you sort of, you know, put them in order and you kind of see them play out, uh, I think is important to the process that it's not, you know, for them it's not just sort of, uh, you know, alphabetic text on, on the screen, you know, until it's finished. Uh, so I think having... Uh, environments like that where it is sort of more visual that you can always see kind of what's on the screen you can always kind of play the you know play the program over and over as you create it are important to that kind of learning um, now it may not be appropriate for all age groups or if you're trying to find a specific way to teach a specific programming language that may be a, you know may not be the best option for you uh, but the other part of it that I know I mentioned but the fact that you can look under the hood right that you can see how other programmers have worked you can take their work and actually kind of you know, use it as a form of modular programming, like taking pieces and chunks from other people's code and, and working with it and remixing it. Like that, I think, is important, too. That there's a community there that is willing to share, that kind of is there to help, but it's not just there to kind of fix errors in your program, but actually kind of let you get your hands dirty in, in their code and sort of take pieces and, and do things with it. So that idea of just, uh, you know, sharing, you know, your actual work of producing through Remix, I think, is 
you know, something valuable. And I don't know offhand if that's in code.org, but I really like that in terms of uh, facilitating learning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's a lot of technologies, things like uh, Flash, for instance, which is not, uh, you know, very popular. You know, people don't really learn Flash anymore mm -hmm. uh, for many purposes. Uh, but one of the problems with it, I think, was that it was very hard to know. You could see something on the screen done in Flash, but you really didn't understand how it was put together. There was no way to kind of drill down into the code and really understand it and use a Flash document as a learning tool. Uh, with things like Scratch, you definitely can. So video games tend to be small group or for the individual. How would you like to make games more interactive with others? How often do you interact with um, VR headsets? So we actually have a uh, something called the, the Cortex Lab here at NSU. It's kind of a new lab, but it's not actually officially open, I should say. Uh, it's going to have its sort of grand opening in the fall. Uh, but in there, they have actually a room there dedicated to sort of virtual reality, you know, sort of providing the equipment, you know, for researchers and students and professors to go in there and work with virtual reality. Um, I haven't done much myself. Like I said, like my focus has really been on the kind of um, like the discourse communities around games uh, and not so much the content of the games or the experience of the game directly, but kind of how users organize themselves outside of the game in order to play the game. Um, and I am interested in things like alternative reality gaming, things where people sort of take on these um, sort of uh, maybe for a weekend, maybe for a long term, you know, do things to try to solve puzzles together or try to uh, sort of uh, take over, say, a, con you know, a hotel or something and sort of enact some sort of role-playing game for a long period, you know, an extended period of time. Um, so I think there are models out there for kind of interactivity that people are trying to develop. Uh, people like uh, Jane McGonigal is one of the people who sort of is, you know, pushed a lot of these types of games, these alternative reality games. Uh, she talks about the kind of you know, emotions that they build, the kind of community that, that they can build when they work well. And I think virtual reality um, it certainly uh, you know shows some promise um, you know and I've you know watched videos of things like you know the Star Trek virtual reality game things like that see how people are using them you know and I think they are uh, you know, certainly interesting but you know many of the uh, you know many of the interactions are sort of you know uh, not really uh, I should say sort of in character which is fine I think you know the things that they're doing that are out of character would be interesting to me um, and so I think they will continue to be small groups and individuals, uh, to be honest. I mean, there are certain games that kind of lend themselves to larger groups, but I think, you know, that just socially, video games are not separate from our social systems right now. And I think that just in general, we are facilitating systems where we have sort of small groups, individuals uh, coming together. I mean, Facebook, you may collect as many friends as you want, but really, I think most people tend to have a, a smaller group available to them anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I have no problem, I guess, with video games reproducing that digitally. Uh, and then our final question is, um, where are you finding most opposition in academe to using current gaming, uh, video games in education? Are you seeing um, academe beginning to use them? So, you know, academia, you know, I usually think is being higher education, and certainly I think there is resistance to using them that is, you know, in classes where they feel like uh, you know the focus should be on content, um, you know one of the nice things about a writing classroom I would say is because that we don't have to focus on teaching content, right? We teach process, we teach kind of how to think, how to argue, a lot of things that can be looked at and studied and analyzed in so many different settings that um, you know video games can provide the kind of space in which to do these kind of things, in which to express ourselves, to um, you know to distribute messages through, for instance. So. Um, but I think in more content-heavy classes, you know, places where they feel that they need to assess, you know, certain types of information, um, you know, they might see video games as being somewhat uh, likely to replace them, you know, like replace them sort of functionally, you know, say, well, if a video game can teach it, then why do they need me, right? Um, you know, as a writing instructor, I know that, you know, even if they could teach the content of writing, they would still need, I think, instructors to, to facilitate the process. Um, but I also say, I think, where you know schools are, are mostly using it is really um, you know, much more at, like the elementary level and such where they're using it to sort of engage students in procedural thinking about STEM activities uh, that you know that portal 2 being used in sixth grade classes to teach sort of uh, you know basic physics 
you know, is really exciting to a lot of educators you know, who see their students identifying as gamers okay. and sort of helping them build those literacies they've already developed in terms of gaming, sort of applying it in different fields. Um, there's so many summer camps right now, for instance, um, where, you know, they have the Minecraft camp and they have the robotics camp and they, you know, but they're often sort of based around games, around gaming, around coding, around, you know, taking the, the Lego robots and sort of doing challenges with them. So you know, I see a lot of educators embracing it at the uh, elementary you know, level, but you know, less so, I think, as you get into higher education. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mason. Uh, I'm actually going to transition uh, to talking about uh, the application process. So please bear with me. And I will be, in keeping with our timeline, uh, I will be very brief. Um, so the first thing I would like everyone to know is that um, if you are interested in our master's program in uh, composition, rhetoric, and digital media, um, the process um, is going to be outlined um, in a few minutes. Uh, the first thing you'll do is you'll go online to complete our online application. Uh, there's a processing fee of $50. Um, the process takes around 30 minutes to actually complete the online application. We would like you to submit your official transcripts. Um, we're looking for individuals who have completed their a bachelor's degree. Um, we also require that you commit, uh, submit your personal statement, uh, which is a way for you to explain uh, or to tell the committee why you're interested in the program. Um, you would submit a writing sample, um, an academic paper, or a professional paper so that we can assess the quality of your writing. We also would require that you submit two letters of recommendation, primarily from individuals in academe. Um, again, individuals who can attest to your ability to perform at a graduate level. We welcome applications uh, year-round. Um, students can enroll in our curriculum in the fall semester, winter, which some schools call the spring, uh, as well as our summer. The deadline dates that are listed on your screen means that all the required documents must be submitted on or before those dates. For students who are from um, who are not U.S. citizens or permanent residents, um, the process will be slightly different in the sense that they will be working with another office at the university, which is our International Students and Scholars Office. Um, the mailing address is on your screen, uh, and that's where you can send us the supplemental documents. Um, you can also have your transcript actually um, emailed to us electronically. We also, within this department, offer graduate assistantships where students, while they're uh, full-time, are able to have uh, uh, financial assistance as they go through the curriculum. Again, if you have any questions about this process, you may contact us either by phone or email, or visit us on the, uh, the main campus in Davie, Fort Lauderdale. A lot of questions uh, that we get asked concerns affordability, and so what I'd like you to know is that we have uh, a department on campus that is totally devoted to answering your questions concerning uh, enrollment. Um, we do offer scholarships for students, uh, scholarships for students who are in our graduate program, both um, scholarships that are located on campus as well as external scholarships. Um, we also provide information on loans to our students, uh, and for students who are in a veteran status, uh, we have a team of individuals who are designed to help you with the enrollment process. We also offer student employment to students, so graduate students may work on campus as graduate assistants as well as as part of our federal work-study program. For students who need help in terms of creating a payment plan, again, we have a team of individuals who are on campus to help you. The first step, though, requires that you apply to get a federal student aid ID. 
uh, and then you will complete the FAFSA form, which is the free application for federal student aid. Uh, you may contact us at any time. Um, the address for the uh, department on the day before Lauderdale campus is located on your screen. Uh, you may also call us or send us an email and also visit us online. So with that said, um, Dr. Mason's information is on the screen. I know you will have more questions after this process, so we do welcome them. Uh, again, you are able to download the PowerPoints from the materials section of the website. So please feel free to stay connected with us. Um, we are on social media, uh, and you can see all the channels on your screen. Um, and you can also visit the department online, which is www.nova.edu forward slash DWC. So um, with that said, um, let me see if there are any other questions. Uh, and they don't seem to be any other questions. So thank you so much. Uh, and again, thank you for participating. And if you do have questions afterwards, please feel free to email us. Um, any final thoughts, uh, Dr. Mason? No, I, I just, you know, thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, I look forward to any questions I receive by email. Perfect. All righty. Thank you so much and have a good evening.